live on StreamYard for the very first time. I've got the amazing Mr. Matt Schaefer here with me. And today we're talking questions to ask a guy, questions to ask men to get them craving, desiring you. Matt's an empowerment and connection coach from the West Coast and a good friend of mine. We've connected recently and he's an amazing bloke. Matt, thank you for joining me. You got something really cool to share. My friend, I'm so excited to be here with you today. I have been uh, a fan of your channel since I started getting into YouTube. So this is really, it's a dream, right? To be able to connect with you and play with you on your channel. Thanks for having me. And hi, everybody who's watching. This is going to be, we're going to have fun today. <laughs> Thank you, brother. That's, Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to hang out today. This whole thing, apparently we can put comments on the screen. We can answer comments. I'll probably accidentally mute myself at some stage. So you guys <laughs> forgive me for that. Uh, but it looks like you can get really interactive. we got and, and Supriya says, hey, Matt and Mark, thanks for joining us. Lily from San Diego. That's sort of your neck of the woods, isn't it, Matty? Got yeah, Carly Lee on here, Mirrors on here. Uh, <laughs> today, we're talking the questions that get men fired up for you. Yes, we're talking the questions. Say, what can you bring Absolutely. up that gets them excited to talk to you and want to connect to you? Exactly. And I think before we get started, Matt, you've got something really cool as kind of a gift for the ladies on the channel today. I do, I do, I do. Ladies, who likes something free, right? Something free that has a ton of value. Me, right? I love free stuff. <laughs> right, especially right now when the whole world's going crazy, right? So <laughs> what, 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 I have, what I have to share, uh, Mark, with y'all, with your community and with all of you ladies is uh, you, you have the opportunity to be a free beta tester for my transformational love course, Mastery of Connection. This is a month-long interactive live course with me. We had, we've had over 4,000 women worldwide do it over the last year with incredible results from Helena's channel, Jack Butler's channel, Helena Hart and Jack Butler, also friends of, uh, friends of ours. So uh, I'd love to offer you an opportunity to be a beta tester of this course. We're gonna dive deep into beliefs, your attachment style, the way you connect with other people, because truly, if we want to have the relationship of our dreams, we get to understand how we connect with ourselves and other people. So it's an awesome opportunity, y'all. We start April 13th. This is the last time I'm doing it as a free beta course. All I want from you is your testimonials and your feedback on the uh, on the experience. So you'll have office hours with me twice a week. You can sign up at the link in the uh, in the bio or in the in the description uh, for this video on Mark's channel. So. Check it out. Let me know if you have any questions. We'd love to have you. Jump on that, ladies. It's a very, very cool offer, and he's not going to be doing it again for free. So why not take it up? Free stuff, and you can do it all. Get all the learnings and just write a testimonial to say thanks to Matt. Would appreciate hey, Matt, that. <laughs> let's get into the questions. Yes. What do you need let's to be asking a guy? What do you need to be asking okay. a guy to get him craving you? All right. So first off, I want to start off with a, with a quote. I want to ground this. I want you to ground, I want to ground you in a principle here uh, that the quality of your questions determines the quality of your relationships. Okay. This is very important. Questions are, are a tool, a way, a way that we can deepen connection and create deeper connections with the men in our lives. Okay. So that's a fundamental principle that I want you to understand. And another thing that I want you to understand as far as your power and the way that you use questions is that you are the emotional and communicative conductor of your relationship with men. Right. If love is a symphony, you as a woman are the conductor of the emotional and communicative dynamics in your relationship. So you, a man is looking to you for guidance <laughs> in how to communicate and how to express vulnerability in relationship. So I want you to think of questions as a tool you can use to help guide and invite a man into vulnerability, into connection and into into everything that you want to create in relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, the truth is us guys, we are sometimes not as good with our emotions as you. Go figure. Who would have thought, right? Who would have thought men struggle with emotions? Oh, my cat just bit my foot. Lucy, could you not? I'm lying. My dog is licking my foot right now. That's weird. <laughs> we've, got, we've got animal problems dismantling the live stream. He's like, uh, right. <laughs> if I picked up Lucy, she would go after me. I'm, there's no way bite your face that. off, right? <laughs> so questions. They lead this experience for men into these deeper emotional states. One of the things men can struggle with is when something scary comes up for us, when an emotional state like vulnerability comes up for us, 
it can be scary to go into or sadness is something men don't deal with very well. And we're not as a tune. Our emotional ranges are typically not, we're not encouraged so much growing up to expand those ranges. We're not encouraged to show a different degree of emotions. And it tends, we also don't talk about them. No. Buddies. Yeah. We don't sit around, Steve, how are you feeling? How do you feel about no. it? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Those conversations don't. just don't come up. And this yeah. kind of leads on, it's a, it's a little slight tangent, but this is why men have such a high value for the women that they're intimate with in their life, because mm -hmm. it's pretty rare we have a, a feelings partner or a feelings friend. You get more of them. We don't have many. Exactly. Yeah. But, well, I know because we yeah. don't, we don't live, we don't live in our feelings the way that the way that women do. Like we're not constantly asking ourselves, why do I feel this way? What's coming up for me and talking to other people in our lives about them. Right. So one of the unique opportunities you have as a woman in the life of a man is to be his sounding board, be that conductor, inviting him. He's the musician in the orchestra looking up to you for guidance, right? You're the conductor inviting him to share, to express his feelings. Cause for most men, they've been suppressing and bottling that stuff for most of their lives and they have no other outlets, right? So questions, especially right now, when a lot of us are either separated from our partners, right? Because of the situation that we're in with this pandemic, or maybe we're trapped in a room with our partner. <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> which, which evil is it? <laughs> which, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Which Either way, you have a huge opportunity to, to get into deeper conversations with your partner. You have an opportunity to get out of the daily report. Because so often when we're so busy with doing all the things of our lives, we're constantly just in the daily report. What did you do? What did you do? How did it go? Enough of that. Let's ask questions that actually help us connect with each other and draw a man towards you, right? And so I want you to really think about what kind of questions could you ask that would get a man to sort of open up? Now, and, I, and the questions I want to start with are questions that are open-ended. Why? What? questions. Okay. So questions that require a man to explain and share something about him. Why do you love baseball so much? Get him, get him talking, get asking, asking him a question that really inspires him to give an explanation around something that he's into, right? It's really powerful for you to actually invite and evoke a man to ask, a, to explain why he's passionate about a thing. Right. And one of the most powerful things you can ask a man questions about are things that he's passionate about, whether it be sports, whether it be science, whether it be whatever it is. Can you ask him a question and then have the courage to like activate and inspire him to give you an answer? So open ended questions that begin with what and why are a powerful way to start, you know, building that deeper connection with him. Yeah. Connection is really the foundation of it is based in vulnerability. And mm -hmm. people often think vulnerability has to be, oh, I have to talk about something I'm feeling very weak or insecure about. It has to be like something, it almost has like a negative connotation. And I had a, a very interesting chat with a client lately and she was so worried about telling her friend, in fact, about a passion she had. And I said, mm -hmm. this is a vulnerable exercise too for you. Because when someone opens mm -hmm. up about a passion, they're risking that thing being shot down, right? If let's say you're super passionate about f fashion, you just have a huge passion for fashion, you love it, it excites you, it lights you up. And then you tell a friend or you tell a guy about it and he just gives you a really negative response. He's like, oh, how could you be, how could you be interested in that? That's pathetic, right? You're, mm -hmm. if, if you're not super secure in that, that could hurt, right? He shot down something that's really important to you. So there is like a, a positive vulnerability as in you can sharing something that's good, especially for us guys, something we are passionate about. That is a form of vulnerability. We're opening up to you. Yeah. We're expressing that and we're risking you shooting us down or thinking we are weird for it. And when you don't, you create the safe space and you lead us into the emotional vulnerability. Exactly. And one of the most, I love that you said that, Mark, is one of the most important things to get a man to be vulnerable with you, especially when you're asking him questions, is to foster safety with him for him to re for him to feel like he can share whatever's coming up for him without, you know, getting judged or retaliated 
uh, for it. So really like keep that in mind, right? That we want to choose response over reaction <laughs> with anything that, that a man shares. So, so another, another thing I want to bring up here is that questions that inspire curiosity questions, questions that really demonstrate that you're actively curious in what he has to say in what his experiences are. So are you coming to these questions with curiosity, right? Like one of the most powerful types of questions that you can ask a man is a question that inspires or evokes a story, right? Because a fundamental point here is that men are storytellers. Like we love to tell stories. Do you love, do you love telling like a good story? Off. Yep. <laughs> yes, we like to show off. We like to talk about ourselves. Who doesn't? Yeah. But we like to get in and, and prove ourselves to you. And when you mm -hmm. give us yeah. a question that allows us to do that, it's like, oh, cool. Here's the floodgate. I can, I can show off something cool about myself or something that I like about myself to hopefully impress you. Yeah, ex exactly. And well, and men create value for themselves, right? Like a, a lot of how a man uh, identifies and defines himself and his value is through what he's done, is through what he's it's doing, right? So often, yeah, it's through his achievements, right? So stories are a great platform for a man to describe, you know, like his value to you and express his value to you through what he's done. So, you know, asking him to, to tell you, a, tell, tell me a story of one of the, one of the scariest things you've ever done. Like or one of your biggest breakthroughs. Like what's, what's one of the biggest, what's, what's, what's something you're most proud of that you've created in your life? You know, give him an opportunity to speak from an empowered space and tell you a story uh, from his life. Yeah. And that's sharing, that's sharing something about himself too, because you give him that open frame. Mm -hmm. You say, well, what, what do you want to share? Here's kind of your blank canvas to open up to me. And then as you've said, mm -hmm. Matt, the response is, is key because if we, if we feel shot down or judged in some way, that's when we will shut down. And it would be the same oh. for you if, if you opened up to us and, and then we said, mm -hmm. oh, what's that? You wouldn't want to open up to us again, right? For you, men tend to create the physical safety. Typically speaking, if you're with a man, you are going to feel, you know, if you're walking in a dark neighborhood or something, or even if you're just with him, you, you physically feel very safe. We mm -hmm. tend to create the physical safety for you. You tend to create the emotional safety for us. Exactly. That's beautiful, beautifully put, Mark. And yeah, so I mean, look at at the at the foundational level, we all want the same things, men and women. I know men can seem a lot different, a lot different than you, right? But it, fundamentally, we all are craving the same things. We're all craving connection. We're all craving safety. It may look a little different, but mm -hmm. if we can sort of like drop this whole, you know, like that it's me versus you sort of thing, and realize or that you know men are a different species than women, we're not. Like we, we, we are craving the same things you are, but it's all about finding ways to communicate and bridge the gap between us. And questions are one of the most powerful ways to do that. Right. And they don't just have to be, you know, like, like deliberately and consciously vulnerable like that, like telling stories. I think one of the most, one of the greatest ways we can use questions is as, as, as a way to play as a way to play with our partner, because here's a fundamental principle here is that at, at a, at a deep level, all men are little boys all men are little boys right we all love to play right mark <laughs> yes yes we do <laughs> we do and it can look a lot of different ways right men might men like and might like to enjoy playing in different ways but like one of the greatest ways you can engage with your man and get him to drop in is by playing with him right so asking him a playful question like like teasing him about something he's into like if he's into uh, like car racing, just like asking him a question, like, so, like, so what is it about a car turning left 5,000 times that is so fascinating? Like, I'd <laughs> love to know. Just like bust his balls a little bit, right? About something, about something that he's into. And uh, it's really like, it's, it's just fun to just like play with a man and engage with him and get him to do. Don't you enjoy that, Mark? When, it, I, when a woman sort of like comes Absolutely. And when you're in play and when you're flirting as well, sometimes you can even turn the questions into presumptive statements. So you can mm. actually do the same thing, but instead of framing it as a question, say, uh, instead of, saying say oh don't you love the car being turned left left at five thousand times you could even say um oh you're the type of guy that small things amuse you mm, i see how it is <laughs> and you you do it you you basically turn any statement that you've got you say i, I remember my one of my past partners she used to because i was six years older than her so she used to always give me shit about old fart but 
being an old fart. She's like, oh, yeah. oh that would that would be something an old fart would say, wouldn't it? And she'd do playful, she'd turn it into, what do you think, old fart? Like she'd turn it into little playful digs, which were obviously done from a foundation of love. But you can flip it yeah. also into a presumptive statement, which creates that that little flirty, assumptive aspect as well. I love it. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Creating that flirty, playful nature because men want to play, right? Like what, how did a man, you know, show that he liked a girl when you, when you were in elementary school, it was by pulling her pigtails or by like throwing something at her, you know, like that was like, <laughs> I want to touch I don't know how to get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was what he had to create a little tension, right? So can you create a little tension? Can you use, can you use questions to sort of bait him out and sort of guide him in that? Or can you use a playful question? Like, like a fundum, like a, like a hypothetical, like a fun hypothetical, like if there was one law that you could abolish today, right. And just do whatever it was for the rest of your life. Like, what would it be? You know, like hypotheticals are, can be really, can be really fun as a, as a game to sort of get him to sort of think about it and open up. Like if you could fly or live forever, which would you, which would you do? Which would you like? And why, you know, yeah, like the, stuff like that. The questions that get people thinking, like if you, there was a really good one, a woman said to me once, and she said, if you had, if money wasn't an issue, what would you do with the rest of your life? You know, if you had infinite money, how would you spend the rest of your life and how would you spend the rest of your time? So things mm. that things that kind of elicit his values as you go along yeah. the way are really, really powerful. I think, Matt, you're going to talk about those in a little bit as well. Oh, yeah. Well, qu yeah, questions that elicit values. And, and what's interesting is sometimes you can get a question that you didn't anticipate uh, would elicit values and, and he'll be expressing his values through it. Right. Mm. Like you could ask a ridiculous question. Like, uh, have you watched the Tiger King, Mark? Have you watched this I'm ridiculous not. documentary? No. Oh I'm my not. God. On Netflix. You have give it, give us a one y'all. If you've watched Tiger King <laughs> on Netflix. <laughs> Do it's I want to know what this is about? Documentary. It's a, it's an, it's an international phenomenon on Netflix about okay. this, like these like messed out tiger breeders down in Florida and in Oklahoma. It's crazy. Right. But it's got an incredibly diverse cast of characters. So you could literally be sitting there with him watching tiger King and just be like, so what, which tiger, which tiger King character do you, do you agree with? Or which tiger King character do you like? And like, why, you know, and like in, in his answer and in the way that he explains that you're going to learn out, you're going to learn a lot about him based upon yeah. like, which one he get behind <laughs> you'll, you'll notice yeah what, what he says it could be people watching you know like if you could live anyone's life in this park you know who would you pick mm -hmm. and right now there's no one in the park because there's some virus around right like well there's no one here <laughs> but generally speaking there's people in the park you say whose life would yeah. you pick yeah i pick that one's because that's a child and i want to i like fun and mm -hmm. play or that guy looks successful so i want to be him he's wearing armani or whatever there it is little things as yeah. you go along can pick out his values you will. You'll learn. You will. You'll get an outline. You'll start to get an outline of who he is, what he's into, what he believes in. It's all very, very powerful, right? And and another type of questions that I want you to I want you to dig into are questions that get him to express feelings. Like like what are you excited about right now? Like that's a huge thing. Like what are you passionate about? Because men tend to be very we're single focused, right? So we tend to find something that we want to get into and we. Shook, yeah, we lock we lock in on it. We lock in what, on it. What right? other like, life? What other stuff? I don't remember any of that. I don't know anything else. Yeah, we get to be men, women are very diffused focused. Women can be in, in, you know into a lot of different things at the same time, right? Where men are like, now I'm into this. Now I'm into this. Now I'm into that. Like, and so if you ask a man, what are you excited about? Not only and 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 then ask him follow up questions about it. Not only is he going to be talking about what he's excited about, but he's going to be getting excited because he's talking about it and he's talking to you. And so if a man feels good about what he's talking about, right? And he's talking to you, that feeling transfers, that emotion transfers. So the more you can use questions to get a man to speak into things that bring him joy, the more he's going to, it's going to deepen his feelings towards you because you've become the activator of that. You're the conductor inviting him into that space. Yeah. And you become associated with those mm -hmm. memories and with him oh i get you know she shares in this thing she's and if you really listen to his answers mm -hmm. you know and he really feels like you have then you you are a way he gets to relive that he gets to like oh he gets mm -hmm. to share that energy with you and of course that attaches him to you because he's not going to want to lose that that's an activation for him 
Exactly. Oh yeah, you you start you start to develop like special significance in his in his life, and you and you you're setting yourself apart, right, from so many other women out there that are keeping their questions surface level. So many times, like Mark, how many dates have you been on? You know, where it's like the the, the conversation just stays at that. You know, like so, how long did it take for you to grow that ponytail, bro? Like questions. Like that. I went on a date once, and the whole date, all we talked about was coriander. That was it. The whole date. I'm like, and to this day, I still, I I don't know. She had a shirt that said something about coriander. It went on for hours. And like, we didn't continue seeing each other, but the text continued forever afterwards about coriander. I'm just like, some of the topics that we can get onto, I just, it blew my mind. And it's okay to get onto those topics, but it's also okay to get off of those topics. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta go deeper sometimes if you wanna care. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, these are all like critical things you want to think about, you know, that men are storytellers. All men are little boys. Can you play with him? Can you get him to, you know, like tell stories about his life? Like one of the greatest things you can do is to is to ask him a sort of teasing question that gets him to talk about his childhood a little bit. Like, I bet you were a real troublemaker when you were little, weren't you? Right. Ask him a question like that and then see how he responds. And notice how Matt turned that into a statement then. He's, instead of saying, you were you a troublemaker as a child? It's a bit more mm-hmm. flirty if you turn it into, I bet you're a troublemaker, weren't you? You're a trouble kid. I know you. I know your type. You see, I, I, it, because you're mm-hmm. making a statement in these situations, you actually take the pressure off the guy to respond, which ironically mm-hmm. makes him more likely to respond, right? Because there's yeah. no, you don't feel pressured. So if you can do those little flirty things, which is any any sort of little cold read, like oh, I can, this is where even flirty lines come from. Oh, I can see you're trouble, as opposed to going, are you trouble? It's more flirty <laughs> if you make it into a statement. And it's and it's safer for him to respond because he feels guided right towards the response that he that you he like he he knows that you want you want him to say oh well you know i am a little i am a little <laughs> trouble you know if you want me to be or whatever like you've you've sort of given him an indicator and it, that's another fundamental principle ladies men do love guidance men men really appreciate you giving them some guidance around around this stuff because as mark said earlier and i will definitely reiterate as well like men don't have a lot of emotional agency we're not really good at you know having deeper conversations or being vulnerable or sometimes even flirting like sometimes we can get gun shy around flirting because we don't want to go too far we don't want to say the wrong thing so the more you can sort of like invite us in and let us know that you want us to go there with you the more we appreciate it because you know we don't want to we don't want to mess things up right especially in the early stages of uh, of getting to know somebody and it starts (laughs) from the very beginning you know i remember it was probably a year ago now there was a, a woman in a supermarket and i wrote about this in my book and she made it so obvious that she wanted me to meet her by just showing mm. up with her. She gave me the eye contact. She gave me the smile. She she didn't do it for me, but she gave me enough to give me the green light that I she wasn't going to give me a harsh response if I tried to talk to her. And that can mm. apply when you're very first meeting someone in the supermarket or it can apply further along when you're getting to know someone. If we think mm. we're going to get a harsh response, because we're also bad at dealing with sadness, we tend to shy away. So your, exactly. your goal is to create the space and then whether or not we can step up to that depends on our own confidence and openness, et cetera. A hundred, a hundred percent. And I love that you framed it like that. Cause that's a, that's a term and a, and a framework that I use with my clients and students all the time is uh, the cycle of invitation and space. You make an invitation to a man by asking him a question of some sort, usually grounded in a feeling statement. You know, I would love it if we did this, I would love to, to hear from you, you know, more often, like, wouldn't it be fun if we went on a spontaneous date this weekend, right? You ask him a question anchored in a feeling statement. And if he likes you, if he's, if he's invested in you in any way, he's going to be motivated by that feeling statement because he wants to make you feel good. Right. And so you make that invitation to him in a loving, inviting, warm, safe way. Then you give him space to, to, to take that action. You yeah. want to, and, and, and is it the space important, Mark? Because the space communicates and indicates the trust, the honoring of that man's ability to do the thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, it's hard to explain. It's hard to overstate 
the importance <laughs> of that space. And, and the other amazing thing about it is not only does it make him feel safe to come to you, is that you have really good information that if you can create that space and he, if you can honestly say, you know, I'll say to my clients, have you, have you been in your values with this guy? Have you been, if their values are open communication, if their values are transparency, vulnerability, whatever it is, once you've done the thing, you have a lot better information if a man can do the thing with you. Mm. Whereas if you don't do the thing, it's kind of like, it's like, Matt, if I said to you, if, if we were roommates, and you said, Mark, have you got any toilet paper? Because I'm out of toilet paper because someone bought it all, right? Yeah. And I said, I said, no, no, I got none. I got none, right? But you actually find out that I do, right? So I'm lying to you. And then I go ask you for hand sanitizer, right? You're probably going to lie to me back, right? Whereas if I'm super, if I'm always open and then I find out that you were lying about the hand sanitizer, I now have a lot better read on you. Right, because mm -hmm. I've I've led the interaction by being open first, and and I've brought my end to the table, and you've demonstrated you couldn't match. So when exactly. you're when you're open with a man first, you allow him to you, you get really clear information on whether or not he can step up to that or whether he can't. And that's 100%. when we talk about willingness to walk away. Mm -hmm. The best indicator that you'll have if you do need to walk away is that, okay, I've shown up and he mm. can't match it. So that's, I have great information. I can walk away with clarity now, as opposed to if you've been holding back and you've been like yeah. scared yourself, yeah. you don't know if he's just reacting to you or it, it's much more gray. A, th a thousand percent. Yes, Mark. I agree with you. I, I totally am into that. And that, that goes to a fundamental principle that I use in my, in my teaching, which is that, you know, like, uh, you, if you want vulnerability, like one of the most powerful ways you can function as a conductor is by leading by example. You get to lead by example. If you want a man to open up to you, like you don't get to hold back from him, right? Like you get to demonstrate to him what it looks like to be vulnerable. You know, and so when he's asking you questions, and let's be sure to take some questions in here too. I'd love to answer some questions from yeah, our so audience. Yeah, seeing the chat, That'd someone, uh, cool. uh, yeah. someone said so, something about man buns. Put your yeah, put about. your questions in put the chat, ladies. I'm gonna see if I've got a light here. I had a light sitting around somewhere because the lighting's a bit <laughs> bad. Continue, Matt. I'm just gonna see if this light is here. All right. All right. So Mark, Mark's looking for a light. And ladies, I want you to recognize that like when you're answering his questions, if he's asking you questions, which if you're asking him deeper questions, chances are he's going to be asking you the same, right? You get to respond with vulnerability. Like you get to demonstrate to him the type of communication that you want to receive from him. Right. So be willing to tell stories, be willing to get a little vulnerable, be willing to share your edges with him in a meaningful way. And he'll, he'll appreciate that. And he'll see, Oh, okay. I guess we can communicate this way. Right. And then also if you're being vulnerable with him and you're inviting him through questions to be vulnerable with you and he just cannot, or is unwilling or unable to do it back to you, then, you know, right. Maybe he just can't meet you on your level and he might not be someone, you know, who's ready to be in the kind of relationship that you want. I love, I love that you use the term willing and able because it's a similar term. It, in fact, it's the same term I use with clients, which is sometimes a man is willing but not able. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's just too many fears in the way. Sometimes he's able but not willing, i.e. he's just not that into you, right? He doesn't want to step up. You need both willing and able. And by leading yourself with that, I know that there was a question here, um, Dan, I have to initiate. Ultimately, vulnerability is going to be something you both – step down with each other into no. like i think you can click like those questions you can cl click them and put them up on the screen oh, I can, I can give click it a shot that oh, way i can okay. see it oh this is oh god okay uh we're getting sophisticated so now how do i show there we go uh mindy said done i have to initiate <laughs> hey i did I, it look at me go yeah, look at this guy he's a regular game show host over oh, here I'm he's on getting fire i'm on fire <laughs> yeah and and the truth is you know certainly with my partner as well you know, a lot of the time she's leading me into vulnerability and she's creating that space. But just like with a good friend, sometimes there are times where I lead her and I create the safe space when she's having a vulnerable moment. So the, the companionship element of this can be very much like a friendship in that you both have responsibility to put make yourselves vulnerable first and be take this kind of scary step forward first and 
let yeah. the other person create that safe space for the other person. Exactly. Yeah. Initiation. Let's not let's not put initiation as a burden that one or the other gets to do in relationship. Like when we're in a true partnership, we both get to be in a continual cycle of initiating and activating each other and inspiring each other to be our best selves, inspiring each other to be the deepest, most vulnerable versions of ourselves. And in doing that, we can facilitate a lot of healing for each other. I know in a lot of my past yeah. relationships, the more mutually vulnerable we were willing to be with each other, the deeper our connection was and the more the more, more we were able to heal each other because we were able to open up about all the stuff that we brought into the relationship. So, it's a it's a privilege. It's I like to say it's the sacred responsibility that we have towards our partner in our relationship is to is to be able to hold space and invite them to, you know, be vulnerable with us and to grow from the relationship. Yeah. And then that should be how relationships are. You know, it should be a, a partnership where you're both bringing each other up and you're mm -hmm. both helping each other heal your own stuff. You're not taking responsibility for it. You are serving as the space to allow the person to heal themselves. And that is the gift of relationships that I think is much harder to get, at least as obviously, when you're not with someone, when you're single. Exactly, exactly. And and that's beautifully said, Mark. And now Chris Bosch is asking, how do we take part in the in the course and mastery connection? For those of you who joined later or uh oh, maybe you're just yeah, joining yeah. us, uh Mastery Connection is my 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 flagship course. It's a it's a month-long live course with me. Uh 25 video lessons. We cover beliefs, vision, values, attachment style, personality type, all the amazing things that will help you understand how you connect with yourself and other people. If you want to take part in this, this is the last Last time I'm offering it for free as a gift for Mark's community. So uh, there's Get a link involved. in the description. Yeah, it's been it's Get involved. There's a link in the description. Look ah, who showed up. Helena. So the link's in the description, y'all. <laughs> Miss Helena Hart. We are actually jumping on a uh, podcast tomorrow with Helena. Matt, you'll have to join ah. me as well. I'd, I'd love, love to have you on too. I'm going to do some podcast stuff. So we got Helena oh. in the house. Helena, uh, let's answer a couple of questions, shall yeah. we? Mm -hmm. Brooke had a question here. Bro, this is cool. I like this program. Mm -hmm. It's uh, right? I can I can use it. I'm, I'm all right with this. Brooke <laughs> says, go, what's the old, old thanks, part. thanks, brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> what's the best way to give a guy space before he needs to ask for it? Says Brooke. Mm. Okay. So uh space in in what way? Emotional space, physical space. Men do need space, right? So if you want to be able to anticipate his desire for space, I think one of the greatest ways you can do that is to like we're talking about questions, you can ask him, "Hey, so would it be cool if, you know, I'd see it seems like you have a lot going on right now or you seem a little preoccupied. Would it be OK, you know, if I like just took a couple of days and went and did my own thing, like ask him some ask him some questions. Be like, would you like some time to do your own yeah. thing right now? I think yeah. a asking him, asking him in a in a in a very neutral, supportive way. Man, love that. Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> I, I, I think your intuition is huge. I think mm -hmm. your intuition is huge with this stuff. And and when you really get centered on your intuition, you'll be able to tell when there's stuff going on. And one thing that my partner's does with me or, or has done with me is that she kind of, she'll create that supportive space, that safe space mm -hmm. and just say, do you need me here right now? Is there anything I can do? Or do you just want to like take space right. for yourself? And then I'll just be like, oh, it's just something I need to process. She's like, sweet. She'll give me a kiss and then she'll go do her own thing. So I, I feel safe that I can go to her, but also that I'm not being pressured. Exactly, lovely. exactly. Lovely. And it's it's important that the energy you bring to that too. I mean, really, and I want this is an important point I want to make here is that the energy you bring to your questions, the energy you bring to your conversations with a man, especially around sensitive like things like this around potentially triggering things is so important because all men have at some level a uh, a, a fundamental wound around women that I call mama trauma. Like to, for every man at some time when he was growing up, right? One of the worst things for most men was when he was in trouble with his mom, when mom was mad at him or even worse, when she wasn't mad, she was just disappointed. Was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah or, or indifferent in some way, you know, and, oh. and pulled away. 
Yeah, it was the worst. And so like you want to make sure when you're coming to a man with a question, when you're coming to a man with something vulnerable, right, that the energy that you're carrying into that conversation is one of partnership, is one of safety, is one of of warmth and love, right? Because if you're very fearful with your energy when you're asking him a question or very angry and confrontational and it triggers that mama trauma wound for him like men all men are little boys right so he switches off into little boy mode and he's in trouble with his mom and up oh, the walls go up and he wants to run right he wants to run yep. away yeah so yep. so be conscious of the energy that you're bringing to the questions especially like that so it's not like so do you want me to leave you alone or you just seem like you don't want me here right now like that kind of energy ain't <laughs> is not going to foster the sort of safety yeah, that not, you want. Right. Dude. But you yep. coming from a supportive place of, Hey, so you seem like you've got a lot going on right now. Is there anything I can do for you? Or would it better support you if I just went and did my own thing for a little bit? He's going to love that. And he's going to feel safe with the question that you, that you asked him because of the energy that you brought to it. To come to you. I love that. Uh, there's a question here, which is from the tweet. She says, how do I trust men again? I've been broken up and cheated on before. I feel like I have commission, commitment issues now. I, I love this question and mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll sort of give give my impression. I'm curious yeah. to, this This might actually be something I imagine you would cover well in your course, mm -hmm. but in that, getting back on, getting into a safe space again. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, when we, I literally broke this down with a client yesterday and this, this, she came to me, this relationship, she said, we mutually ghosted each other. I didn't trust him at all. And it was like this big of distrust that had exploded. Like the distrust yeah. tree had grown yeah. in the relationship. It was giant. So we traced that tree yeah. back. We traced it back. And we looked at the very time that in that relationship, something, something went wrong. Uh, and I said, where did the trust first break down? What was the very first time? And of course, the world is our mirror, right? So the first time a partner stops trusting another partner is typically the first time he or her stops trusting themselves, mm. i.e. the first time they ignore their intuition. Exactly. So we took a deep dive into this moment, which was, it was actually very mundane. It was a simple little moment where she asked him a question and she felt something was off, but she didn't say anything because she didn't want to embarrass him. So she stopped trusting herself at that point and the mistrust between the two of them begin to form and 12 months later it was a giant calamity mm -hmm. right so i will take a client back i'll take a client back to those moments to understand what's going on in those moments and the fear that led her to not trust herself in those moments yeah and then by resolving that fear and going through your new relationships and going into new connections understanding where that fear will crop up for you and understanding that little that little small difference that you, you that little pivot that you've got to make when that particular fear comes up and addressing that fear mm. obviously there's deeper stuff healing and stuff we'll do around that but by addressing that key pivot early in the relationship you prevent the whole rest of the distrust tree from growing in the relationship so the, the bottom line for me is is getting back to trusting yourself and it's getting back to trusting yourself, your intuition to speak when you need to and to know, because women always know, you always know, right? When a guy's, when something's off, you, you know, if I really stop you and ask you, I know you're going to be able to tell me honestly what your intuition is saying. Is this him? Is this you, etc. And when you're mm -hmm. back in that energy, you'll have no problem trusting men again because you now trust yourself. Absolutely. I love that, man. That, that I love that. Take on that. Um, I'd love to hear yours. Huh? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to answer it. Yeah. And, and truly like, so you've had trauma right around relationship. You have been broken up with, you have been cheated on, you've been betrayed in the past, right? So or, originating from that point of trauma, like Mark was talking about, right? Like there, there was a wound that was created. And from that wound, you know, beliefs started to flow out of that. You're trusting yourself, your beliefs about who you are, your value. They started to, they started to shift your beliefs about men. I guarantee you, based upon, you know, the experiences you've had, you have created broad beliefs about men and intimacy and relationship based upon that. And so what's really what the most powerful thing you can do to begin to rebuild trust in men is to look at the beliefs flowing out of your trauma and ask yourself, are those beliefs serving me? Are those beliefs uh, helping me connect and build relationship or are they harming me? Are they keeping me isolated? 
because that's the thing, our wounds, when our ego gets wounded like this, right, it goes into lockdown mode and it wants to keep us safe. So if you believe that all men can't be trusted, then what are you going to do? You're not going to get into relationship and you're going to be alone, which is safe on one level, but is it worth it? And right? worse, you'll create those outcomes. And right? you, oh, you'll and that's, that again. Well, and that's the thing, you know, part of all of module one of my, uh, of my course, right. A mastery connection that y'all have free access to, uh, is about, is about the cycle. It's in the, in the link in the description, y'all is about the cycle of beliefs into results, right? There is a cycle. Uh, there's a, a series of dominoes that happen when a belief gets activated through a triggering event that leads to the results in your life. So if you have any questions about what your beliefs are, because I like to call beliefs are the invisible box that we live in. We often don't, we don't know our beliefs like in terms of like the verbiage of them. If you want to know what your beliefs are, look at the results of your life. <laughs> look at the relationships that you're creating, right? And, uh, and, and ask yourself like what beliefs would form these? Like what beliefs would lead to these results, you know? And so we're going to go through in module one and break all this stuff down uh, and help you choose new beliefs because that's what I want to invite you to do the twe 09 is really look at those beliefs that are not serving you and consciously make a decision that I am going to choose to adopt new beliefs around what who men are what they're capable of the kind of relationship that I that I'm worthy of right and then act as if that belief is real within you like adopt a belief and then start taking actions in alignment with it and watch the world transform <laughs> when you choose a new belief and you start acting as if it already is alive and present in your life you will be incre you will be amazed at how the world around you transforms to come into alignment with that new belief you have the power you have the power to do it love it love it thank you matt don't forget you can access that program by the link in the description. Pop up a couple more questions. We've got a few going on. Can you see the chat as well, Matt, or is it just me? I can see it, man. I can see it. I love it. it. Nice. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. If you have a question you want to grab out, then let me know. And questions as well. We were talking about questions. You spoke about family and child. Uh, yeah, you did spoke about family. You spoke about childhood challenging him as well. I think you touched mm -hmm. on that, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. So we talked, we touched on it a little bit, but like, what are ways that you can challenge him, challenge his worldview? Ch what are questions you can ask to uh, challenge his frame? Like we talked a little bit about race car driving, right? Like asking him like, so what is it about making 500 left turns? That's so exciting. I don't get it. Or if they're into baseball. So <laughs> like, what is it about watching guys stand around scratching their Sweet. crotch for three and a half hours? <laughs> That's so exciting. Or for or or for me, like if I was dating a girl who was into soccer, I believe what you Aussies call the the football, right? I'd be soccer. like, yes, soccer. football is the game soccer. you play with. Like football, football yeah. versus soccer. Yeah. Do, do Australians call it soccer? Do you guys call it football? Yeah. Footy. We call it we call it soccer because we have oh, football three types of football. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, so, so that's a sport that I, I mean, I can't wrap my head around, right? So if I was dating a girl that was into soccer, I would just be like, so they, all they do is just run back and forth and kick and nothing ever happens. I don't <laughs> understand like why, tell me why it's so right. So right there, you're challenging her, you're challenging him in a way that's getting him to like defend himself in a fun, playful way, engage with you and letting him know that like you're strong enough in your frame of what your, what your, what your likes and dislikes are that you're not afraid to call them out on differences, right? Differences between what he's into and what you're into because no man likes a doormat. No man is activated and turned on by a woman who just goes along and agrees with everything that he's into, whether she's actually into it or not. Doesn't, isn't that one of those like uh, sort of devaluing things, right? Mark, that you find that women do sometimes yeah. when they're putting much pressure on themselves. And, and we can feel it. Because you're not doing that because you, it's, it's not authentic. We can feel it. If you're doing that when you don't really like those things, the guy will sense that you're doing it as a reaction from him. You're doing it to seek rapport in some way. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to like soccer because he likes soccer. But we mm. can, even guys with our relatively average intuitions can tell when something's happening as, as, as our reaction request. Oh, you you want us to like you because you like soccer too? It's it's very obvious, and it's much more endearing to feel your boundary, to to feel kind of where you end, 
Because if you say, oh, bloody soccer's terrible, you can enjoy that stuff on your own. I can't deal with that ridiculous game. Like, we can feel the authenticity in that and we feel, okay, there, there is separation between the two of us. Yeah. And it's that separation that ironically actually builds connection because we don't feel enmeshed with you. We feel there's still distance, which is the root of desire and the root of attractiveness is creating distance. It is. It is. That brings up a beautiful, there's a, po there's a book of poetry called uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Have you read The Prophet, Mark? I've not. No. Oh. Oh my God, it's the most beautiful thing you'll ever read in your life. And there's a, a sonnet in the middle of it called On Marriage. So it's this guy doing a bunch of different poems on marriage and he talks about marriage and he says, you know, the way that a, a, the way that a, a cathedral stands so strong is because of the space, it's not the pillars, but the space between them that allows them to be strong. <laughs> and the music of a lute is only created because the strings are given enough space to vibrate in harmony. And in that, in that space is the magic. And in marriage, space is what yeah. creates the magic between two people. So I love to use that. Like space is one of the most magical and valuable things that exists between us in relationship if we use it the right way. 100%, 100%. If you want a book that talks about this as well, I know Matt mentioned The Prophet. Esther Perel's Mating in Captivity is another wonderful piece. Mm -hmm. And she talks a lot about building attraction between long-term partners and how the fuel of it is always in space and in, and in mm -hmm. un unknown. The, the little bit of gap that that space creates is where the magic happens. Amen to that. Uh, Mark, question here, man. Chrissy C, Questions. right between, Chrissy right between Brooke's question and Twee's comments at 431. Uh, Chrissy had a question about avoidant attachment style that I'd love to, I'd love to take that one about her yeah, avoidant, let's get it. avoidant attachment style. My dog is going crazy. Okay. There we go. Matt's dealing with his dog. My boyfriend opens up every now and then, but has an avoidant attachment style. I give plenty of space, but what do I need to do to get him to let his walls down and be fully vulnerable? Yeah. So Matt. that's something that I, I, that's actually all of module, uh, module three is devoted towards module two and module three. We really dig into attachment style and the dynamics between different attachment styles. Okay. And so often what happens is uh, a woman who maybe has anxious attachment style uh, or secure or anxious will be attracted to an avoidant partner because they th what they think is happening is there's a ton of chemistry, right? Because the anxious attachment style person wants a lot of attention. And in the beginning, the avoidant partner gives it to them, but then the avoidant partner takes it away. And then what that does is that triggers and it activates the person's anxious attachment style and they get very like elevated about the person and they think, oh my God, I'm falling in love with this person. When in reality, what's, what that's actually happening is they're getting triggered by that person. They're getting stimulated by them and it's called the anxious avoidant trap. And it's a dynamic that a lot of relationships fall into where they confuse physical chemistry with, uh, with just triggering of attachment style. So it's important to look at, you know, like what's that foundation of what, what's the dynamic in your relationship, right? Because if you guys are constantly just in this yo-yo back and forth where you're pushing in and he's pulling away and then you're getting frustrated and then he comes back in, that isn't a healthy dynamic, right? And so how to get an avoidant attachment style man to open up, like you got, you got to recognize that avoidant attachment style men, they value their autonomy and their independence uh, over everything. Like that's their most, that's their primary uh, motivator. And they see intimacy as something that's a threat to their, to their autonomy and to their independence. You see what I'm saying? So like, it's going to be up to you to really create and foster an understanding with him that uh, just because you are going to, just because you want him to be vulnerable with you, doesn't mean you're trying to take anything away from him. You're not trying to rob him of his identity or of his independence, right? So are you creating safety with him? Does he feel that there's truly a safe space for him to be vulnerable? Or are you so frustrated by the fact that he's not getting vulnerable, that you're just getting aggressive with him about it? Because if you're just harping on him, like, why don't you open up to me? You know, like I do everything. If you're getting that, like, you know, classic role that women end up in when they're, when they're emotionally starved, right, for attention and affection, and you start to develop that frustrated energy towards him, it's actually just going to get him to retreat further, which is obviously going to get the opposite of what it is that you're wanting. Yeah, I agree with everything Matt has said there. And creating that safe space is is so foundational because as soon as you're going towards him and as soon as he feels that, 
it's the the avoidant guys they always want to do like oh i'm getting away from this by you creating that space and, and you finding that security within yourself and then communicating all this to him by the way which if he can do that you know if an avoidant guy is more aware of it and more communicative about it that makes a huge difference as well uh, and then your needs obviously matter too as you go along and you know i have certainly dealt with women who are hitting their heads against the proverbial brick wall when it comes to this stuff where they create the space and the guy the guy just can't match them and if you let that go on for too long that can be erosive to you because you're you can be totally secure you can be totally secure I, there's a video where i dated an avoidant woman for a little while and even though i created the space didn't chase her or anything it just it slowly got to me because I'm like, why am I insecure around this girl when I'm not typically like that? This is quite unusual for me to feel this insecure with someone. And it took me realizing that she was avoided and just not willing to go there with me to to let it go. I, I still communicated that I wanted things to go ahead, but I wasn't, wasn't going to chase. And mm. she went on her merry way and my self-esteem was a lot better for it, even though it was hard at the time. Yeah, so, but it was it was worth it, man, because you're, I'm sure you're yeah. super secure attachment style. Like I have no doubt about that. And for you as a secure attachment style, someone who's avoidant is just going to over time. It's just I'm the same way. It's like confusing when I meet a, when I go on a date with a woman who's avoidant and then, you know, I text her the next day after a great date and she doesn't get back to me for like three days. Yeah. I'm just, just like, like, just like, this is weird. I'm just not dealing yeah. with this. Yeah. This is, <laughs> yeah. Because Failure to yeah. failure to connect, right? But see, and what they want is they want you to chase. They want to feel you agitated and and sort of like discombobulated. So it's something to really ask yourself: is Chrissy is is it really working for you to stay in it? Because avoidant attachment style partners very rarely change. So I mean, it's it's almost if you're not avoidant as well, and the two of you can't play that game together and enjoy it, it might not be worth it for you to stay in that in that relationship. So it's just something to look at. Yeah, I think I think ultimately you've got a you're you know you're a team with your partner. So mm -hmm. if you guys as a team can find a win win in a way this works for both of you, then it can go ahead. If you feel like his avoidancy is giving off to is is. Un, you know, is serving too many of his needs as opposed to meeting your own, um, then in a very relaxed and vulnerable way, you know, you can communicate that first with words and then eventually with actions. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so many good questions. What are the questions? Yeah, I know. Keep, keep rolling with the questions. Who, what do we got here? What do we got here? Uh, well, both of you in a live stream. Thanks, Gina. Jumping online. Gina says, I'm single because I compare men to someone I'll never have. Crazy, right? <laughs> I, I won't say it, Gina. Hmm. I won't say it. But we can all get images, right, of what we want. And we get this perfect image. And I was literally talking to a client yesterday because she works with a lot of men. And the men in the bro -y club, she's a firefighter. So the men are all in this bro club, right, where they're comparing very superficial <laughs> aspects of women. So yeah, all day, yeah, yeah. she's around men who are picking women apart superficially. Oh, that ass is not good or that legs aren't good enough. Da, da, da. And these are all beautiful women, right? And really, these guys are just reflecting their own insecurities, right, in picking out these parts of women. But if you have a perfect image in your mind, then that's that, that doesn't exist. You, you, you can't connect with that because no one is perfect. So yeah. being okay with... Dating someone who's imperfect and being someone with someone who's imperfect is also about being okay with those imperfections in yourself. So that yeah. could be a good little... Can you put the question up? I'd love to see it. Oh, uh, yes. This was Gina's here. <laughs> Yeah. I, and that, that, that perfection, perfectionism is a, it's a, it's a, I like to say it's a deflection strategy, like perfectionism and needing the perfect partner or the perfect relationship is actually a very deep form of procrastination and self-sabotage. It's one of the mm -hmm. deepest ways that, uh, that we all, you know, we, we, we hide behind the idealized partner 
right? And that gives us an out. That gives us an excuse to not uh, to, to not pursue meaningful relationships. So really, like we get to ask, we get to always move forward in relationship, just in committed, imperfect action. Like be willing to have things be messy, be open to new possibilities, right? And and keep in mind that what our what our perfect person might be might be completely different from what the actual you know reality of our dream partner is you know be open to something different than what we think I, I our dream is do you uh, see that yeah a lot? right a lot. yeah yeah um it's it's, it's it's so powerful yeah i mean my my partner and so many clients partners have not been the person you know the idea right of the person we thought we'd have and when you really go deep with someone, you you realize that that stuff on the outside has nothing to do with it. It's all about you getting to know the insecurities and the vulnerabilities of that person. And that's where deep connection really forms as the questions that Matt's been talking about help create that space for that connection kind of demonstrate. Exactly, exactly. And let's let's circle back for a second and talk about some of the questions that we've talked about. So we've talked about open ended, why what feeling questions? Why does this excite you? Yeah. Why do you love this? I can see how excited you are right now as you're watching this thing as you're doing that activity. What is it about it that lights you up questions that invite him to speak into his feelings? Super, super powerful. Another very powerful type of questions, questions that initiate and invite play. All men are little boys and all men have a play drive. We want to play. So ask him questions that are playful, right? Like te teasing questions are, are super powerful, fun hypotheticals. Like what law could you abolish? What would, what would be your strategy for the zombie apocalypse, right? We're halfway there right now with this current situation. Right? <laughs> I saw a meme. Did you, I saw a meme floating around the internet that was, it was a person poking a coronavirus and saying, come on, make zombies. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Like oh, coronavirus, make zombies. Damn it. Oh my God. It's so oh, it's no. so messed up, right? But we got to find a way to laugh about it. Okay. We got to find a way to laugh, especially in relationship. Men want to have fun. Men want to play. Light opinion questions. Which Tiger King character are you cheering for and why? Because here's the thing. If a woman says that she is into that woman that for sure mur murdered her husband and fed him to the tigers, if a woman that I'm dating with says that she is behind that woman, I'm out. I'm gone. Like it's done. <laughs> it's done. It's so done, right? But it's like, great. And these questions are going to give you insights into this person's character. Another type of questions, y'all, questions that tell stories. All men are storytellers. If you're watching Naked and Afraid and you're watching it with them, that's a show on TV, right? Look at him and be like, when's the last time you felt naked and afraid? Tell me a story about when you, have you ever been, you know, up in a tree with like a puma down in the ground, like trying to eat you or like, tell me, a, like, I'd love to hear a story, right? Like any question or invitation to tell a story is an opportunity for a man to demonstrate his uh, passion about something, to brag, to, to give you, yeah, a little, to give us a little ego demonstration, right? Around that. So storytelling questions are so powerful. And questions about family, right? I bet you were a troublemaker, weren't you? You know, like with a little flirty twist is a powerful yep. way to a powerful question to ask, you know? And and then questions for a little later in relationship. I, these aren't questions to ask right up front, but I wanna end with a couple other questions that are a little bit deeper or whatever, is that once you get a little, you know, you've known him for a little while, you've been on a handful of dates, you know, asking questions about, you know, his vision for his life. Because especially if he's a high quality man, especially he, if he's an ambitious man, you know, who's he's probably got big goals and he's probably got, you know, a vision of where he sees himself. And you can learn so much about a man by the answer he gives to, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? You don't have to use the word vision. You can just be like, what, what, what do you think you're going to be at, you know, in five years? Like if 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 things are thing, the way things are going right now, like you have this big, amazing life, like do you what do you see creating? moving forward in your life, you know, and just let him like think about it. And if he hasn't thought about it, it'll give him a chance to be like, that's a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about that before, you know, like, well, and and then, then you've got like a starting point, a launching point for a lot of like deep sort of self-reflective conversation. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think under the right circumstances, I've had a couple of clients as well who are quite intentful in their dating where they say, I am really committed to, you know, being married quite soon. I want to be married in, say, or at least engaged in 12 months. 
I say, okay, you're going to have to be a little more aggressive with your filtering and a little more intentful without being yeah. bearing. And, and so those clients, a simple thing is we will bring some of those vision questions up quite early, which is like, mm. hey, like, where do you see yourself in a few years? It, it's not coming from a place of where do you see us in three years, mm. right? That No, don't, don't, don't do that. that. Don't do that. But it's, what, where are you at in three years? Like, what are you working towards? And she's, she's not stuffing around, right? She's looking for a man who's like very clear on his vision, who wants kids, what's a family pretty soon. And it just, it saves time to be more direct for some of those clients. Mm. It will obviously spit more people out in the way because, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't super sure about that or don't want to open up straight away. Mm. But depending on your timeline, you do have that option to, to raise these things early. If done in the right way, it can mm. give you very powerful information. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent hugely just the way that they respond. Do they lock up or do they open up? Do they actually think about it or do they just give you some canned response? Do they talk about how they want to feel in their life, the experiences they want to have, or do they talk about the stuff that they want to have, how much money they want to make? You know, like it's a great like sort of litmus test as to a person's values. So throughout all these questions, something I want you to be listening for is what do these say about his values? What do they say about who he is, about what he's into? You know, like these are very important. Like everything a man's telling you is feedback and giving you secrets and details about who he is, even if it's a Tiger King question. It doesn't matter. Like any question can give you a huge uh, breakthrough around who this person is, right? And so uh, that's a really powerful. And then at a certain point, you can ask him questions about his past relationships. Like what kind of women, you know, have you sort of attracted? And again, not up front. Right. But once you've been getting to know somebody a little while, like asking him non like you're not being confrontive, you're not being invasive, but you're curious. Like, so what kind of women, you know, have you dated in the past? Like what, what's your normal sort of like relationship dynamics with women? Like, what is it that's drawn you to your past girlfriends? Like just sort of like asking him questions that let him know that you're secure enough in yourself and your value that it's okay for him, you know, in a, to, in a reason to a reasonable degree to talk about you know, his exes, because they're a part of his life and you're interested in, you know, the journey of his life and his ex. You're not threatened by that. You're interested in him. Uh, I once had a woman mm -hmm. ask me, you know, what's, how does she phrase it? She said, what's the most valuable thing or grateful learning you've had from a past relationship? Like what a mm -hmm. brilliant way oh. to give me permission to open up and talk about not only talk about my exes, but talk about them in a positive way. She's kind of angled the question so that it's, it steers away from any negativity and it allows me to open up and kind of litmus test me where if I go quiet, then she's going to get the, oh, something up there. That's not quite, that's not quite right. Whereas yeah. if I'm really open and, and especially she'll listen, she'll be listening to the way that I talk about my ex as well, because you know, most women know that one day if things don't work out, you know, that could be them, right? So they want to hear like how, what's his general perceptions of women? Does he say, oh, yeah. oh man, this was a crazy bitch. And like, I just, yeah. I can't believe what she did to me, right? It's a victim against women. It's, it's bad. Whereas if I'm like, actually, you know, me and my ex took a lot of time, but we're great friends now. I learned so much about compatibility and I learned heaps about myself. And yeah, I'm really excited and really grateful for that relationship. She's like, well, worst case scenario, you know, he talks about like that. He talks like that about me one day, which is a lot better in terms of what it says about me and my values and the way I see women, etc. Exactly. I, any man who says all like if I ever date a date a woman or I'm on a date with a woman and she says all of her exes are, you know, evil or manipulative or terrible or whatever. I'm like, oh, boy, yeah, exactly. I'm, oh, like, I'm out of here. See ya. I got to, I got to go. You I got to like, feed my pet rock. Bye. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's the common denominator there in all your exes? All your exes are, are awful, right? All your exes are crazy. You, you're the common denominator in all of that, you know? So it's a huge, uh, it's a huge, huge red flag. And so speaking of red flags, let's, let's end this with like a couple of types of questions you want to avoid, right? So a couple of questions you want to avoid. And Mark, tell me if you've got experience with this, uh, job interview questions, right? So <laughs> yeah. feeling like, because have you ever gone on a date, Mark, that's felt like a baby daddy audition? I, where there's too much intent, yeah, and you feel like you're that that I'm just being weighed up for like my potential my sperm here and to be 
Yeah. Like a potential yeah. father. She doesn't care about me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's when, when, it, when, it, when a man starts to feel like a woman is uh, got an agenda, right? That she's evaluating you for a specific purpose in her life. And beyond that, you know, that's, that's the most relevant thing right then. Uh, a man doesn't feel seen. He doesn't feel appreciated. He doesn't feel trusted because you got to remember men are very experiential. What a man is craving on a date with you, he doesn't care about your resume. He doesn't want you to read, you read him your resume about of all your accomplishments. You know, he doesn't want you to try to prove yourself to him like that. He doesn't want to feel like you're auditioning him to be the, his sperm donor, to be your sperm donor. He wants to have an experience with you. He wants to be able to put down his walls and feel and play and have a have a journey with you right on that date. So don't turn it into a job interview. Don't turn it into a baby daddy audition. Like avoid those avoid those questions like of, of specific intent right off the bat because they're going to get him to keep his walls up. They're not going to get you. They're not going to get you to be vulnerable with him the way that you want. Yep, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, other questions, other red flag questions, not to ask, Matt. I mean, really, and this goes back to energy. Any question asked with scarcity, desperation, jealousy, like any question that's coming from a space of lack like oh you've dated a it looks like seems like you've dated a lot of women a lot of women in the past like what's up what's up with that like why have you why have you had so many so many girlfriends you know or like a question where like a man feels sort of interrogated or like you're coming from a fearful space is going to demonstrate you know sort of like lower value to him and it's going to get him to sort of pull away or not feel like he can be safe with you so remember like you always want to be asking questions from a space of partnership and a space of confidence rather than from a space of yeah it's, it's really the vibe it's really the vibe that comes across with the questioning because even a very similar question with a different energy and feel to it can be very i want to pull away versus oh she's just like genuinely supporting me for example if a, if a woman was like if she said you know what's been what's been one of the challenges what's something you've grown from then that's a great question right that's something i can open up and talk about whereas if she as if i started so let's say I started opening up and in for an, in a different conversation, I started opening up about that thing. But then she said, oh, well, that sounds like really challenging. Oh, are you, you know, it's almost accusatory. Like, oh, so are you going to be okay to like meet someone or, you know, already I'm feeling insecurities from her tone and it just makes me go, oh, I don't feel as safe anymore opening up here because I feel like there's this pressure on me or these insecurities are being put on me in some way. Yeah, uh, exactly. Or, or like you're putting him on the spot, like you're being like confronted like that. Like I had a, uh, I, one of my mantras is that my voice is changing the world. Right. And that's a mantra that I use in my life. It's a mantra that I use in my work as I've been a sp pro pro professional speaker now for, you know, like two, three, four years. And so my voice is changing the world is a mantra that I use to ground myself in whenever I do public speaking. Right. And I was talking to a woman that I connected with on Bumble or something. This was like last year. And I told her that that was one of my mantras that I use in my business and in my life. And she said, oh, she's like, well, you know, isn't that like kind of like just egocentric of you? to just think that your voice can change the world. And yeah, I just was great. like, are you kidding me? Like I was so like appalled that she would, you know, go there with me and try to make it into an ego, like some sort of ego trip. <laughs> and then I spent yeah. 20 minutes defending, you know, my, my life mantra to this woman. And I was like, just blown away. And I, and I never wanted to hang out with a woman less than like <laughs> by the end of that conversation, you know? And it's important, ladies, you recognize the same stuff in guys. Because I think sometimes you all can be really loving and give them the benefit of the doubt and overlook that stuff. But you can see if Matt would have spent a week, a month, God forbid, a year with that kind of attitude, how much would it have eroded him, right? And, exactly. and your ladies sometimes give these guys the benefit of the doubt when your intuition says, get the fuck out of here. Like, let's go. Let's go. So spot this stuff. You know, spot it and, and trust your intuition with it. Because if you're getting stuff like that back as well, that's not your person. 
Exactly. And it's okay that they're not your person. You're not supposed to be for everybody. Questions are a great way to filter people. They're a great way to build connection. They're a great way to weed out people that aren't in alignment with who you are right now. They're a great way to communicate your value and your values and whatever it is that you're into, you know, like use questions intentionally, use them to play, use them to connect. And, and especially right now, right? Like don't, don't waste this time that we have in this, in this quarantine state, right? Like we have an opportunity available to us to get, to build deeper connections with the people in our lives through the questions that we ask them. So, uh, give us a one y'all, if you're committed yeah, to just, like, to doing this right. And this is the best dating environment for practicing this. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Matt, you got to look at this, Matt, your blue eyes and blue shirt work great. Ah. Oh. Couldn't have said oh it better my, myself. Oh, oh my god! I got a, I'm getting a, oh. I'm getting an eye an eye compliment on on your thing. Well, she didn't say hair, so you still got you get the hair trophy, dude. There's, there's been like 50 <laughs> comments about your hair, bro. Picture flow of me floating around with short hair somewhere. There's a Facebook filter which I'll bring up at some point. Uh, we got a good question from Brooke that Brooke here that uh, I have an opinion on this. I'd love to hear yours. Can I yes. go from having an anxious attachment style to a secure one, or am I stuck with one style? Mm, I I mean, I, I can tell you from personal experience, yes, you can, because I did. Yeah, that didn't change. And you, yeah. I agree. I agree. And you do you know change. how there's books that say you can't, but do you know how I know this? It's because I've seen secure women go to anxious if they spend too long mm. with an avoiding guy. Right? Mm. So it could definitely get worse. I've seen evidence yeah. of that. And I've also seen evidence yeah. of people who have made it better. So a hundred percent yes from me as well. A hundred percent yes. And then how and so and that's it's great that you bring that up because we get into attachment style deeply in Mastery of Connection. So if y'all haven't signed up, I'm offering a free beta of Mastery of Connection in the link in the description. It's gonna be a month-long amazing course. And we dig into attachment style in module two. And you can change from anxious to secure attachment style by releasing the beliefs and the insecurities and the wounds that have sort that that anxious like, attachment yeah. style is flowing out of. Of, right. And so once you identify the beliefs that are uh, sort of surrounding your anxious attachment style and you start working through them one at a time, you can start shifting into secure attachment style. It takes it takes a little while, you know, and you got to be patient with yeah. yourself, but it's 100 percent possible. I, I have a client who's gone from, I'd say, severely anxious. And then it, and then mm. sometimes without diving too deep into attachment styles, when you're really anxious, you can sometimes get so scared that you actually swing to fully avoidant as well. So wow. she was swinging pretty bad from, from one end, very, very anxious in one relationship, and then was so badly hurt by being so anxious, she swung to extremely avoidant, which is like an emotionally unavailable coping mechanism. Yeah, I'd say totally. it's probably taken, probably taken four months, maybe five, but she's sitting quite pretty near the middle now she's still working on it and she, sometimes she has a bad day where stuff comes up but mm. she has exercises to deal with it and i'm sure like it's very similar in your program if you join this program uh you can get you can get to that center point quicker than you probably think if you do the work yeah exactly and you'll recognize you know when you're having an off day that this is in an alignment with what you're committed to right now because just as important as like doing the work is recognizing that it's okay to have off days and just to self-correct, just to auto-correct. Because I mean, I still have days where I've got a lot of anxiety. I still have moments like I went on a date with a avoidant attachment style woman. And then, you know, the next day, the next couple of days when she started playing games with me, I did get triggered. And then I'm like, hold on, I'm getting triggered by this. Like what's going on? And it was her trying to pull me back into you know, my old patterns, because that's what she wants. She wants me to be in an anxious, you know, destabilized space. And then I recognized that. And I said, this isn't who I am anymore. And I'm not going to play this game. It's like not even a question. And I was able to like self-correct and just cut off connection with her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. I always, I always think dealing with, dealing with avoidance, the idea I have in my head is, is you, you stay right where you are and you stay open. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. they will come to you and they will get their shit together and stop being like, like so scared to invest and they'll start investing in you. Or sometimes they will float off on their way and find someone else who's more willing to chase them. But if you yeah. can just stay put, stay put and stay open, it's not about yeah. staying put, it's like buggering them off. But you, if you can tolerate the vulnerability of staying put 
with an avoidant and staying open, it'll make you vulnerable. It's uncomfortable. But if you can do it, you get really clean answers as to whether or not they are commitment material for you. Yeah. My, you know, my mom and Maya Angelou said it best, right? When people show you who they are, believe them. And through a person's actions, through the way he shows himself to you, when you're in a grounded, aligned space, being an open invitation for connection and vulnerability. And like we've been talking about all day, right? Giving him the space, giving him guidance on how you want him to show up through the questions you ask, through the way that you're showing up, through the invitation you're making to him. And whatever he does in that space, that's who he is. That's what he wants. That's where he's at. Like, don't pay so much attention to the words coming out of his mouth. Pay attention to his actions and the way that he's moving forward with you. And that's the truth, right? Yeah. So uh, it's it's just, a, that's, the form, that's the formula to use. Yeah. Ultimately, you only ever have control over yourself. Yeah. Right? Your yeah. thoughts, your beliefs, your actions, that's the only thing you can ever control. So if you can get yourself do the healing, you know, do the work behind it, but then get yourself showing up truly authentically. That's when you'll see who can step up and match you when you create the space and who just isn't ready. And the hardest part is sometimes the people that are not ready are the ones where there's good chemistry or where they're very attractive. But if those people aren't <laughs> ready, you can't, you can't chase them down that rabbit hole. You can't force them. You can't force somebody that you're really physically attracted to. And I felt you, I felt a little personal tinge on that, Mark. And I know, man, you meet a beautiful woman and, and it's just like, oh my God, if only she was in a place <laughs> where she could <laughs> handle this relationship. It's like so heartbreaking. It's like, oh my God, I would marry you if you were just like 40% yeah. more emotionally developed, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I realized mine when I got addicted to an emotionally unavailable woman was a, a high school wound was mm. you know i'd never dated a woman like that in in high school and kind of always craved it always wanted it and always you know sat through high school kind of being unpopular and not really knowing kind of why i wasn't good enough to date someone like that and and it surfaced mm. when i met someone who perfectly fit that image uh who then didn't have the emotional capacity or availability uh, or maybe even interest to to match me and it was only looking back six months later, I was like, why did I get so addicted to someone? And I'm sure she's a lovely person, someone so useless for me. Like, <laughs> why? How did that happen? She was, she had, she did, she didn't offer really anything. How did I get so addicted? And then it took a little while. I was like, oh, that's the girl I always wanted. That's the girl I always wanted mm -hmm. to date in high school. Uh, that, that makes sense now. And a lot Isn't of guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's common and I've seen women be on the other end of it, coach a lot of women who are on the other end of it, the guys who just want the validation rather than the vulnerable person behind that. A thousand percent, man. And I completely relate to that. I was the same way. I was not popular. I was not dating the the, the, the hot ladies, right? In uh, elementary, middle or high school, like throughout my whole childhood, I was pretty isolated. You know, I was a bit of an outsider. And, uh, and then when I got that, that established a self worth, a self worth wound for me that led to me spending my whole twenties, like my college and beyond, uh, spending all my time and attention chasing toxic women, like dumping all my time and energy into damaged women that wanted to, you know, take everything I had to give. And I felt like it was creating value for me by dumping everything I had into them. So instead of like dealing with my own self-worth issues, I just tried to validate my self-worth by fixing a broken person. And that was a, that was 10 years. That was a decade of my life. Part of why I'm so passionate about this work, right? Is because I truly feel and why I did my first course as Mastery of Connection, because you really get to start with inner work. You get to really work on your understanding of who you are and your connection to yourself, right? Before you go out there and foster relationships with other people, because if you don't, all the relationships you're out there creating are just mirrors for the inner work that you haven't done yet. Your self-worth issues, your, your false beliefs, all of your limited thinking, right? So you're going to attract relationships that are just reinforcing that for you. So like, let's do this inner work, y'all. <laughs> uh, join us right down in the link in the description. Join us for Master Sal, Connection. Sal's joined us. Sal says, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt and Mark. I just accepted your free course getting set up now. So there you go. Go and join <laughs> Sal. And Matt's in there as well. There's lots of cool content in there. And it's the last time he's going to be running it for free. It's a $2,000 course. So make sure you get involved in that and take advantage of it. 
take advantage, get do the work. You know, it's uncomfortable, but do it. It's worth it. It makes it, it's, do it. it's so it's so worth it. It's so so worth it. <laughs> Uh, Matt, did you want to answer a couple more questions before we finish yeah, up today? Absolutely, let's party. You have a you have any particular question that strikes your fancy here? Let's see. Okay, going up through the questions. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, there's lots of someone says hot flash, Matt. No, no hot flashes, Mindy. I'm not having hot flashes. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was that was the eye compliment. That was the eye compliment. It got you. That was a great, that right was to a great one. Right to the fields. <laughs> so, and I said, thank you for the great session. Uh, secure attachment style sounds like the perfect place for me to go after mm -hmm. one year. After one year of a difficult time with my man. Thank you. Love that, Valana. Love it. Love it. Love it. Mm. Mindy says, "I love these information sessions." I love Matt's eyes. There you go. Look at look at this. Oh, I love blue eyes. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it all day. <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, I I can relate. I've always I've always found blue eyes very attractive, and my partner has brown eyes, and I think they're the most beautiful eyes in the world. So it just shows you don't always end up with what you think. Exactly. I thought for a second, Mark, you were going to start hitting on me, and I'm like, dude, not on the live stream. Uh, like, let's wait till we get on. Not. <laughs> inappropriate okay, fine. But, hey, here's a good one up here brn says if a man admits offers info to having cheated on previous partners pick put that one up that's a that's a good one yeah uh, what time is it on uh 502 502 pacific's gonna be 1002 boom australia if a man admits offers information to having cheated on previous partners but says he does not want to screw this new relationship up is that a good sign or a bad sign you now that up? I would okay. love to, I'd love to. And I would say, uh, absolutely. I think it's a good sign. I think the transparency around past yeah. behavior is a great indicator that he's committed to actually reforming that behavior because truly like if we're going to be out in the world, forming relationships with people, like we get to start grounded in the belief that people can change, that people can grow. Right. Because that's just a fundamental thing because we all are changing and growing in relationships. So I think the fact that he, you know, has not only been transparent about his past transgressions, but he's also said that he's committed to not screwing this up like he has in the past. He's acknowledging his past pattern and letting you know that he doesn't want that moving forward. I think that that's beautiful. You know, is it great that he cheated on people in the past? No, obviously not. Like that's definitely not a good thing, right? But the fact that he's acknowledged it and he's he's committing to something different with you, I think it's fantastic. What do you think? Yeah, Mark? I agree. I think I think awareness is always the first piece, and it's a vital piece. Um, mm -hmm. I would be curious to know in this situation. You know, if a woman said this to me, my my ears would prick, and I'd be curious to listen if she elaborates more. Um, and what I'm listening for is I'm listening for the timeline. Like if this has happened last month, uh, I'm thinking it's great that you're aware, girl, but you might not be at the stage, especially if this has been a repetitive pattern for you, where you've done the deeper work to to recognize why. Whereas if this is like four years ago, six years ago, this kind of stopped happening. And then there's been that space, that story adds up a lot better that, okay, she's really aware and she's had time to work on this. And then the second thing I'm listening for after the timeline is, is how aware and what work she's done. Like if she says, mm. oh, I've, you know, or if a guy obviously says, oh, you know, I, I cheated on these three women and, you know, I, I spent a year trying to figure out what the hell I was doing. And then I went to a couple mm. of psychs and I still wasn't getting answers. So I ended up going to a coach and I realized that I had this wound around validation and validation seeking. And it meant mm. that my inner child like was just like crying out and that every time I needed this ex external validation to feel like I was enough. And by really diving deep into that, I realized, you know, I know what my pattern is and I know what was what was causing it. And, and thankfully that allowed me to get into the, the healing, you know, side work that I do now. Mm. If a woman says something like that to me, I'm like, awesome. Like, that's that's amazing. She's aware, she's acted on it. You know, the, the story that she has, the skills now, the relationship skills adds up. Mm. 
Whereas if she was like, oh, I feel really bad. I like cheated on the last three guys I was with and like I broke up with him a month ago. I'm like, it, I respect your honesty. <laughs> That's awesome. I have grave doubts about your ability to... It's like someone walking into a courtroom and saying, judge, I know why I did it. Uh, I know why I killed those three guys. Uh, I'm very aware. I have a problem. Uh, can I, am I good to go? Um, we're all sweet. <laughs> I'm aware of the problem, right? I'm, I'm, it's all my fault. Yeah, awareness <laughs> is the beginning, but you need to be able to back it up with some evidence, I guess, understanding. And, and I just yeah. be intuitively listening to the person to see if that evidence was there. Exactly. Yeah. And so the fact that he says he doesn't want to screw up this new relationship is great. So now maybe you can, you know, where the theme is questions, right? On this show. So ask him follow up questions. He'd be like, okay, great. I'm I'm glad. And always start off with acknowledgement, right? You want to acknowledge a man for that share. A man being vulnerable like that. Thank you so much for being vulnerable with me. And I love, yeah, I love it. It feels really good to hear you say that you're that you don't want to screw this relationship up. Like acknowledge him and ground it grounded in a feeling statement. You know, reward him for his vulnerability and then ask a follow up question. Be like, so how are we going to not screw this up? Like, what are you committed to? Like, what are you committed to doing? How can we work together? Right. We talked about partnership questions. How can we work together to make sure that you don't screw this up? Yeah. You see, and, like. And if it's how, you if it's new and it's too early to use like a we term, just use a you term. You know, yeah. what, what did you learn and how, how will you make sure that you, you know, what's your plan to kind of, how, how do you know? What'd you learn it, from it? Yeah, to get yeah. a different outcome. Yeah, what did you learn from it? And how are you gonna, how are you gonna make sure that this doesn't happen again this time? Like, I think those are great questions and they'll, they'll open up an even larger conversation, but that's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful question. Thank you. Uh, and Love then it. right above that, uh, Tony Ryder had an interesting question uh, at five o'clock. Tony Ryder. At five. Oh, I don't have that one because that was, I think, before the. Hmm. Mine only goes to five oh one. I can't go any higher. Oh, oh, I'm talking about five o'clock. Uh, you, oh, does your do your comments cut off at five? Uh, Elmer's is the top one. So sad. I'm nosebleed. Her. I don't have anything. Past that, we've been going since four, so we got a whole hour. Is it? Did it eat the last hour of comments for you? Uh. <laughs> Did it? Maybe it did. I, I can't scroll up. Maybe my tech idiocy's finally got the better of me, but I can't. No, I don't have anything above Elma, unfortunately. What's the question? Oh, God. Right oh, God, old man. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got it. I got it. Tony, Tony Ryder, Tony Ryder says, uh, gentlemen, do you have any advice for individuals wanting to get back into the dating world after their significant other has passed? So if they've if they've lost a spouse so this would probably be you know maybe people that people that have been widowed right for in, so in one way or another and uh i think that's a great that's a great question because like right, it's like how do we learn to love again after loss i think so that's you, a beautiful sorry, was it the woman or the man or was she asking for herself I think she's asking for herself. I think she's asking like for individuals wanting to get back. I mean, she said for individuals, but okay. you know, for people who yeah. want to get back into dating after a significant other has passed. Uh, and yeah, it, there's, there's always this struggle when I'm coaching a client in this situation around guilt, which is I feel guilty about, you know, moving on and wanting to enjoy myself again or have connection again. Um, and one of the ways we, we switch, or I help a client switch mindset around this is we remind them that the love they had is never going to be replaced. It's, it's not, you're not replacing a new person with an old person. It's like, it's almost like a different soulmate. It's like a different thing. The, the reality mm -hmm. is every chapter in life ends uh, very sadly. And unfortunately, sometimes that ends too soon. And we lose someone that we love and are very, very close to, you know, who's, who's wonderful for us, but they're not things to compare, you know, that having, having a new connection, which I'm sure that person, especially if they were loving and wonderful to you, that person, previous person would want you to be happy. And if you don't see it as a comparison and you rather see it as a, as a different, a, a new chapter or, or a new book, you know, something that adds on to what you had with the previous person. That's a reframe that starts to help clients after they've taken a little bit of time to grieve, obviously move into a new space with someone new. Absolutely. I love that, man. I love that. And yeah, really like letting you know, like I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to replace this person, but I am worthy of loving someone again. 
right? I am worthy of new possibility because I've had multiple clients who, you know, have had their husbands have, have died of like dementia, Alzheimer's, and they've spent years taking care of somebody that gradually ceased to exist, even though their body was still there, you know, so a really long, painful process. Right. And it's been so beautiful. It's so, it's so painful to watch that. Right. And I can only imagine going through that, like watching the person you love melt away literally before your eyes, you know, but then it's been so inspirational to see these women, you know, embrace excitement about the possibility of new love. You know, like not giving up on love or creating some narrative that this was the one person that I meant to love in this lifetime. It's not true. Love truly does spring eternal. Like it's all, there's always a possibility of new love if we're able to open to uh, the possibility of creating it. And we decide that we are worthy of that. You know, like, mm. so just because you've lost somebody close to you, whether it be because they died, whether it be because they just disappeared, they left for some reason or whatever it is, like you get to let go of the survivor guilt or the beat up conversation that you may have around that person and really embrace a belief that you are worthy of love and that you're going to stand for that truly. So yeah. I, I absolutely think that, uh, you know, like you get to love yourself. Like, so if we're talking about advice for people that are wanting to get back into dating, it's own the fact, own the reality that you're worthy of that. You're not trying to replace that person, like Mark was saying, and that you're going to start just getting out there, allowing yourself to be seen. It's easy after you've been hurt. I'm sure Mark, you can relate to this. It's easy to want to hide it, hide out, hide away. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, and it does take time. It does of take course. Time. Yeah, it's certainly something that can happen. And, and ultimately, you remember that that person before wanted you to be happy. You know, they wanted mm -hmm. to see you. Yeah. They don't want you to sit there miserably, you know, for the rest of your life. That's not That's not what they're about. Not if they truly loved you. Love you. Ex both. Ex yeah. Exactly. What would they want? What would they want for you? Would they want you to be in isolation, hiding out? No, they'd want you to be putting yourself out there and allowing somebody else to see you and love you and celebrate you the way that they did, you know, in, in, an, in their own way. Uh, we've got a question mm -hmm. here from Belinda. And um, Belinda says, I'm an alpha woman and want an alpha man, uh, but I keep drawing beta men into my life. I don't want to be the man in the relationship. How do I mold a soft man? <laughs> I love it. I love How it, do I mold does. a soft man into being hard? Uh, Matt, did you want to kick this one off? Oh, absolutely. This is like my bread and butter right here. So many, so many of my, so many of my clients fall into this category, believe yeah, and so I can feel, Right? Yeah, I completely understand your frustration, and so I want you to visualize relationship as a container, right? You've got a relational container. Within that container, there is a masculine and a feminine side within the container. And when a relationship is in polarity, when a relationship is in polarity, you've got the a majority masculine partner and a majority feminine energy partner on each side of the container. And they're honoring the fact that, you know, for the most part, they stay on their side. Okay. So what, uh, what alpha women tend to do is they tend to, you know, I'm sure you crush it at work and I'm sure that you are a very successful career driven woman and that you kick ass right at what you do. But then a lot of times women will take that same energy that they used at work to get incredible results into dating and into relationship and just what, which is very masculine energy. And they end up coming over into the masculine side of the relational container. And the, the, the key principle here is that two people cannot be on the same side of the relational container at the same time. So if you're in your masculine, a man is going, a man has two choices, right? A man can either meet you at that same masculine level and you guys can have a confrontation or a com combative situation around it, or he's going to default into feeling emasculated and pull away from you. Right. So what you get to look at is like <laughs> you, you want an alpha man. You want a man that can stand up to you. I fully understand that. But you get to start off by asking yourself, am I showing up soft, feminine, inviting, warm, loving? Am I honoring the feminine side of the relational container when I, when I meet up with a man? Because every time you go on a date you have created a relational container. Every time you talk to a man, you're in a relational container. It can be five seconds. It can be 30 years. It's always a container because you're in that dynamic with him. So you really get to check in with yourself is does he have, does he have the space 
within this dynamic to be masculine? Or am I trying to just sort of push him to be what it is that I want? Because the way you framed that last question, how do I mold a soft man into being hard? <laughs> beyond beyond the, the very easy sex joke that I'm not going to make because I'm a mature adult man here. Uh, <laughs> Do it. Do it. Like it's not it's not about you uh molding a soft man into being hard. It's you being soft enough that a man can be hard, that a man can be empowered with you, so that you know you two can create that sort of balance and polarity in relationship. Yeah, I, I love the way Matt phrased that. And this is something that I work on a lot with clients. It's it's what I tell my bread and butters as well to be honest i love it and when i'm working with these alpha women and in fact i've got a new program coming out on this as well the key is that the pattern at work as matt's talked about the default pattern for a lot of these women when they're under stress is a masculine stress response so what do i mean by that a masculine stress response is typically when you solve your problems by kicking butt, taking names, taking ownership, more responsibility. You're the type that steps up, right? Mm. But the more that stress response comes out in a relationship sense, the more you'll take the role of, if I'm feeling a bit vulnerable or a bit unsafe, I need to step up. I need to step up. I need to go, go, go. I need to take charge, make decisions, blah, 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 whatever it is. All the stuff that kicks butt at work. If you get stressed in a relationship and you do it, unfortunately, what ends up happening is you have this combative thing as Matt says where you're both in a similar stress response and for the women who are really good at this and and if you're a doctor if you're a lawyer if you're a CEO you better be good at this or you're going to get kicked yeah. out of that job damn quick hmm. but in a relationship sense if that's your classic stress response it can go the other way uh, and the result can be you get chased by a lot of beta guys who are the only ones that can kind of polarize that and feel safe with you hmm. so unlike myself i have a more feminine stress response right which is when i get too overwhelmed i'm just like oh, i can't do it uh and, and, and step down yeah. matt's the same right so for us when we get stressed the we have to step up someone with a feminine stress response man or woman needs to step up whereas someone with a masculine stress response they need to step back and watch the world burn sometimes right and be okay yeah. with it. And just and be just okay with it take it off mm -hmm. take take the foot off um, and the vulnerability required in relationships is a very different invulnerability that's required at work. So mm. yeah, that, that's a really good question, Blend. If you do actually shoot me an email uh, and I'm happy to, happy to, um, I've got a new program coming out as well, specifically catered for this. So feel free to shoot me an email, mark at makingyours.com.au if you do want to apply for that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, and Belinda, I, I, I'll I, take, look at, yeah, look at, look at your ways of being Belinda. Look at your ways of being. Like, how are you showing up? Like, are you showing up authoritative, aggressive, commanding, controlling? Those are going to be more masculine stress responses, right? Or are you consciously choosing to adopt, you know, uh, curiosity and warmth and invitation and, and, and joyfulness and like all of these more feminine responses? Like, because if you're coming from a frustrated place about a man not showing up, you know, then you're just going to push him further back into that softness that I know you're not you're not looking for. And probably <laughs> attract men who are naturally soft, which yeah. is why the how do I to, how do I mold a soft man into being hard? You 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 can't change someone, right? If a man has a feminine stress response, that's not going to be your guy. You mm -hmm. got to look for a man with a more masculine stress response, and then find your own. I'm going to lay back and make myself vulnerable here. Scary as this buddy is. And that's going to be how more men show up in that space for you. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Uh, we got a link in the description for Matt's program as well. So make sure you hit that link, get involved. It's a really, really cool program. And it's the last time he's ever doing it for free. It starts April the 12th or the 13th, I believe it is. April 13th. Uh, what else? Any other last questions before we jump off today? Looking at the... Last three serious relationships. Uh, Jess had a question here. Mm. Last three relationships. Ooh. Number one, come out to find, come to find out he is gay. Come to find out is gay. Number two, was a workaholic too tired for sex? 
And number three just told me he thinks he's asexual. Am I doing something wrong or am I incredibly unlucky? Mm. Uh, I'll kick it off. Yeah. That I, without doing a little bit of a deeper dive into your history, I find that hard to answer. Uh, mm. But what I can say is that you are the common denominator. So you've been the common thread through these. And somewhere along the line, I suspect that early things have happened in these relationships where your intuition would have felt something was off. So if I was doing a deeper dive with you, Jess, what I'd do is I'd, I'd go into these points where, where did you where did you first notice this? Did you not bring something up you felt you should have? Was there a fear that kicked in for you? Like, how did you end up in these three situations, girl? Like, what, what were the series of circumstances that led you there? And we'd break that down and I'd say, okay, once we know that, we will know if you are responsible or what parts of it you are responsible for. And then what parts of it you're just damn unlucky and, and this isn't out, this isn't about you. But there's going to be elements exactly. that do because you're the common, but I, I don't yeah. know how and there's some parallel happen. issues. Oh, sorry, I, I cut I cut you off there. Oh, I uh, I was just gonna say I don't I don't know how much without breaking that down a little deeper, Jess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would need definitely need to know a little more. Uh, but I one hundred percent think that when you have when they're that when there's that parallel, because these these situations are all parallel, right? There's something around physical intimacy, something, some sort of fear or some sort of resistance or some sort of belief around physical intimacy that keeps showing up, that keeps getting mirrored back to you in these men that you're bringing into your life. So like, I would really invite you to look at, you know, like what, how, what was the relationship between your mother and father? Were they, were they affectionate with each other? Did they, did they seem, were they ever physically, you know, did you ever see your mother holding your father's hand? Was he abusive to her? You know, like there's a lot of, I mean, I would, I'd love to ask you a bunch of questions too. Like, cause this is a, this is a really powerful pattern that you've had, you know, but chances are somewhere in your early stages of development, you created a, a real dysfunctional, there's a dysfunctional belief or something around physical intimacy that's just kept coming up. And you're not even thinking about it when you're meeting these men, right? True. You're just being yeah. drawn to them because they're modeling something that you saw your parents do or something that you saw in the early stages of your life. And you just made a connection. Okay, this is how men and women interact with each other, you know? And so once you are, identify that and release that, uh, you'll break this pattern, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's, it's important. Yes, that's there's, there's – Certainly a theme going through there that, yeah, that's a powerful point, Matt. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Checking out the questions here. Uh, we've got very, very frequently, let's have a read of this one. Kay says, I very frequently mix up my anxiety with my intuition. Uh, a lot of times, I feel like I need to stand higher here so I can like get over the yeah. question. <laughs> a lot of times, I think the guy doesn't like me. And it's just my anxiety kicking in. How do I know if it's my intuition or my anxiety kicking in? Nice. Great question, Kay. Oh, I love that. I love that question. I, love that. I, uh... question. I actually, I did a video on this as well, which is a video I get asked about a lot, the intuition versus mm -hmm. insecurity video. So I'll find a, in fact, just as a kicking, just as a kickoff point, I'll put that link to that in the chat so you can get a kind of foundation on that mm -hmm. video. It's this one. I did a video on it too. Yeah. It's got a video on as well. So just search Matt Schaefer, Intuition versus Insecurity. There's a there's a link there to a video I did on it. I find clients always know. That is when I really sit down and break it down with them and we pull apart their beliefs, which is something Matt covers a lot in his course. Because when you know your beliefs, you can really start to see, oh, these are the narratives that I'm attaching. Like I had a client message me a few days ago and she sent me a screenshot of a number of texts and I, I saw it go from... He's being a bit avoidant, which he was, that was her intuition, to he doesn't care about me. He's being, and she literally sent it in the same text, Mark, he's being a bit avoidant, he doesn't give a shit about me. And I had to pull her up on like the first part, that's your intuition. What narrative have you attached to this? And mm. as soon as I actually stopped her and got her out of the, the, the stress response of it, she knew, she's like, okay, I get it. And we had a journal about it, which is a really powerful way, which is what is the thing this is a pretty simple journaling ex exercise. What is the thing? What's happened? Mm. What's the fear that has been triggered? 
So what's the thing? What's the fear that has been triggered? What is my intuition telling me about the situation? Hmm. And what is the narrative and meaning about myself that I'm attaching to this? Right. And it's, it's actually, when you sit down and write it out, you'll usually get a very clear indication of, okay, that's intuition. He's doing this. This is the extra narrative and shit that I'm piling on top. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. The narrative that you, I like that. I like that concept. I like the visual of the narrative that you put on top of the intuitive response. Cause I think that's often where we try to talk ourselves out, right. Of the intuitive hits that we have, you know, we try to negotiate ourselves out of following our intuition. So, so often. So I love that. Uh, I love that visual. I'm just going to put this in the chat for everyone. What was the thing that happened? What was the fear? What does my intuition tell me about this? What is the narrative? What is the narrative about myself that I've attached to this? In the chat. And the other thing you can do is you can add a fifth question, which is what is the empowered truth that I would attach to it? Or what's the empowered meaning or belief that I would attach to it in my mm. best self state, my most confident self? So you can answer those questions and that will really help you pull those apart. And there's a video link there as well on Matt's channel, as well as mine that you can follow. Yeah, I'll put a link, I'll put a link to that as well. And a framework I like to use because, you know, basically you've always got two different things, you know, like seeking for control in your, in your, in your mind. Like think of like the little angel and the devil on your shoulders, right? Like all the times, so like in those visuals you've seen in cartoons and stuff, you've got like your, your, your intuition slash your higher self and you got your ego, right? You've got these two forces that are continually vying for, for control of what? Your, your behavior, your behavior, your thoughts and your actions, right? And so they're, and they're, what they're using, what they're using to control your behavior, to try to control your behavior is your thoughts and your feelings. So you're constantly getting bombarded from both sides by thoughts and feelings from your ego and your higher self, from your ego and your, your, ego and your intuition. And I know it can be hard to distinguish those uh, disting disting distinguish which of those it is. It can be. So, but what you get to look at is what is the end result, right? Is the end result of what your ego, of, of what the voice is trying to get you to do, what the thought and feeling trying to do, is the end result disconnection? Is it isolation? Is it disempowerment, right? Is it disconnecting mm -hmm. from, from people and things that mean a lot to you? Is it is it weakening? you or is it strengthening you is is it connecting you with other people is it helping you expand as a person like look at the end like look at the end result of and ask yourself if i listen to this voice if i take the action that this voice is asking me to do like say for in your example that you were talking about the the narrative that you were hearing is you know oh this person just doesn't like me and so then what's the what's the what what flows from that this person doesn't like me therefore i should shut myself off from him so i can avoid getting hurt more i'm gonna i'm gonna to yeah. cut him off before he has a chance to yeah. cut me off. So fuck this guy. I'm out of here. I'm not answering his calls. I'm done. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and so then how do you end up? You end up in that place alone and validating that wound that you don't deserve to be with somebody or that all men are, are, are looking to take advantage of you. And that's a vicious cycle that your ego uses to try to keep you safe. Right. Where, whereas the end result, like say your intuition is saying, you know, uh, you should go out there and connect with people and it might be scary to you. Right. But if you do go out there and you keep connecting courageously with people, you know, you're going to connect with more people. You're going to build more relationships. You're going to have more experiences with men and you're going to find more people that you can relate to, which is going to take you further towards what it is that you intuitively want and crave at a higher level, which is deep and meaningful relationship. So like, look at that, look at the end result of following the voice <laughs> all the way to the, to the end result of, of it. And you'll, you'll start to be able to distinguish it, uh, as to whether it's your intuition or your ego. Security. Love it. We've got a question here from Jackie. Jackie says, how do I stop myself from being closed off with guys? Because I feel like I'm going to be a burden because of my disability. Uh, Jackie, I want to give you a personal shout out as well for only writing two lines because it means my face is still on the screen. So thank you for that. You are magical. Can you put your camera down a little bit there, buddy? So people I, can see. You. Get up here. Here we go. And on a refrigerator box or something. Okay. Yeah, I'm not tall enough, guys. I'm too short. I'm the short guy. All right, Maddie, do you want to feel this one? 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, I so I want to look at the second part of this, right? So I feel like I'm going to be a burden because of my disability. Okay. So that statement right there. What are the? I want you to ask yourself. What are the beliefs underneath that statement? I'm going to be a burden. So my disability is a burden to men, right? Men are going to feel oppressed by the fact that I have this this condition or whatever it is. Right. So look at that. Look at the beliefs that you've created. You're projecting a belief and making an assumption about how men are going to value you. And so another belief is that men only want women that have all of these different functionalities. Men don't want diversity of any kind. So you're making broad assumptions about what all men want or that my personality and what's meaningful about me won't you know, compensate or make up for whatever deficiency I feel that I have because of this, right? You're making a lot of huge sweeping assumptions about what men want and value and also about, you know, what gives you value in dating and relationship, right? So really like look at where you're choosing to focus and what beliefs and narratives you're allowing to control your your behavior. I mean, it really goes to what we just talked about, right? Like our ego versus our high, our intuition. You know, your ego is telling you, close yourself off from the guy, right? Because you have this thing and he's not going to like you anyway. So why even bother trying? Stay safe, stay alone, right? And it's at the end of the day, is that serving you? Is that serving you? It's It's, it's simply not. Right. So like you get to ask yourself, like, is it worth it? Is it worth it to keep adhering to this false narrative? Because can you actually know that no man, that every man is going to think that your disability is a burden? You can't know that. You fundamentally cannot know that. And I guarantee you that the the shining light of your personality and everything that you've got going for you, all your value and gifts and talents and strengths that you have would deeply resonate with men out there. But in order for them to be able to see those aspects of you, you get to allow yourself to be seen. And, and so it's just like really asking yourself, like, what am I going to commit to? Am I going to commit to being safe or am I going to commit to finding meaningful relationship? Because you can't have both <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. That was very, very clear. It's the beliefs around what's going on with your disability, that this makes you less attractive, that people aren't going to want you because of it. That's leading to the safety or the lack thereof. And the ego's coming in. So well said, Matt. I love Thank that. you. And Jackie had a follow up. If you want to put the next follow up oh. uh, there, which is no, which is great. Uh, uh, I get what you're saying, Matt. But I'm only saying this because I've been in situations where the conversation starts off good, but they run when I bring up my disability. Um, I will mm -hmm. I will say something on this, which is that I don't know if you've seen my video, Jackie, where Jamia and I do a demo about how to tell a guy you have chronic disease, something you can't change, right? With anything you can't change, it's something you have to learn to accept and love in yourself. And in the video, Jamia and I use HIV as the example thing that we're telling the person. And it's very important that the way you tell it as well will show all your beliefs in, in clear, visible daylight. So if you are texting like, oh, by the way, I have this thing, every guy will run, almost every guy, right? Because of the way the information is being presented and your mm -hmm. beliefs about it, you, making you less attractive, they all come through that text. Whereas if you show up and you say, hey, this is, this is me, this is what I'm grateful for about it. This is how I've come to appreciate this lesson in my life. Men remember, remember what Matt was saying, men are experiential, right? So we're looking for the experience. We're not really listening to the words too much, we're listening to our what we feel and the experience we have when we hear those words and when we're spending time with you. So check out that video on the, the demo that Jameer and I do, and it shows the importance of you, first of all, getting in with yourself and saying, hey, this is something that could even make me more attractive. Right? This is a gift that I have to give to the right lucky man. And then when you present that information as such, that experiential experience will come across for him and he will feel that too. And none of those old beliefs from you will pass through your words. Exactly. I and so what? What's what? A great component of that, Mark. I love. I love everything you said there, man. And I agree with you 100. percent Is that like when you're getting ready to have this conversation, you know, with him, like before you talk to him about this, get grounded in 
what what blessings have and this might be challenging right if you haven't done it before what blessings has this disability brought to your life how has it made you stronger how has it made you more flexible how has it made you more creative how has it helped you evolve and grow as a human being right and then you know sharing it with him from that space not from the space of i have this thing that i feel is really going to burden you because it's something that you know like i i don't feel i feel really resistant to and everything and you know like when that's the energy when you bring that heavy energy uh and, and maybe even a sense of shame around what it is that you know you've you've got going on to that conversation he's picking up on that energy and he's going to take your word for it energetically Mm -hmm. on what it is that you know you're getting ready to share with them but if you say hey you know so i've had this going on for you know a number of years it's been challenging but i wouldn't be who i am without it and i love who i am so it's a part of me it's a package yeah. deal and this is what it is that's yeah. a grounded high value way of sharing whatever it is that's going on with you you know and and that's the way where a guy will then be like okay i i really respect you know that you're coming to me with this in uh from that energy i'll, I'll grab the link for this video because there's a step-by-step -step process of how you can how you can do this jackie i'll put the link in the chat for you there you go hit up that link and that gives you a step-by-step -step process on it uh, let's take it. one more question before we dug off today. Last question. Uh, Barbara says, I've watched your content. Very grateful for it. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, let's have a look. What question have we got? Yeah, we've got a couple. Lives in a different country. Let's finish with Kelsey's. Kelsey says, how do, how do I get a guy I like? How do I get his attention? I think is what it means there. He lives in a different country but I go every year and I've had feelings for him for years, but I don't know if he feels the same, although we are close. So Kelsey, this is a, this is a question that I'm personally quite passionate about because the amount of women, Kelsey, that I see spending time, too much time on guys that really might not deserve it or might not even be options at all is staggering. Okay. How do I get this guy's attention? He lives in a different country. Okay. So to begin, the long distances are I've seen at work. I've done long distance and doing long distance myself, but it's a giant compatibility wedge to consider. Uh, every year I go, I've had feelings for him for years, but I don't know if he feels the same, right? You've spent years here with this guy taking up this space in your head, right? When there's could be so many men who mm. want to get to know your beautiful personality, your beautiful spirit, your beautiful emotions, everything about you live even next door to you right and not only that you haven't brought it up with him girl and this is how you get stuck in these things for years is is you gotta if if anything was to ever go ahead with this guy it's got to be expressed and especially with long distance there's got to be a plan okay we like each other so we're gonna like do this for six months and if it works really well you know then we spend time in the same place and there's like a, a plan it doesn't have to be too high pressure but there needs to be something in place so that the situation isn't open-ended because open-ended yes. mud pits like this is exactly how you go, huh, what have I done the last five years romantically? Oh. Oh, I haven't really haven't really learned too much or had too mm -hmm. many experiences. I kind of thought about this one person the whole time. Yeah. And yeah, you, I, I don't want to use the term waste, but you, you kind of do waste your best years thinking about someone who is probably not an option or not willing or able to be an option, mm -hmm. right? So my advice, Kelsey, would be to... Well, there's a few things you could. I definitely say that you got to get in or get out with this. Like, like do something with this in the next few weeks. Do yeah. something with this in the next month at the max. Either tell him how you feel and say, "Hey, I felt this way. Would you like be open? Would you want to get together and check his response?" Or if you decide that's just never going to happen, go through the pain, cut it off. And I think there's probably an element of this feels a bit safe for you because he's not present and he's he's not as threatening as local guys. So you'll probably have the challenge of yeah vulnerability of dating locally on top of that, but it'll be a good challenge for you. It will be. It will be. I love I love that, Mark. And yeah, and so I, I you said it you said it perfectly. And the one other thing I want to add to this is the concept of bandwidth, right? You have a limited bandwidth within yourself, within your consciousness, within your mind, within your heart to entertain relationship. Okay. Just like your computer 
has a specific amount of bandwidth to like with the internet, right? So if you're streaming a high definition movie, you can't go ahead and open up two or three other movies. Like if you're streaming one high definition movie, like you, you can't open up three or four others. Like your bandwidth is predominantly gonna be occupied by that one movie. You can have a couple browser windows open, but you ain't opening up three or four more movies. You know what I'm saying? So just like this man within the theater of your mind, this man is playing. So he is the center. He is consuming a lot of your He's bandwidth. Right. Yeah, exactly. He's hogging. He's hogging the bandwidth, and like you haven't, you haven't been able to even fully be open to another man because this man has been taking up a lot of real estate in your head and, and consuming your bandwidth. So you get to like, you get to get really clear with this man on if there is a possibility, and if so, what steps are we going to take? to sort of pursue it and see what's possible. So it's gonna be stretchy for you to share your feelings, to lead with vulnerability, ask him some powerful questions, go back and listen to this, you know, listen to this recording again and go through the questions, maybe do mastery of connection and really get to do some deep belief work with us, right? Check the link in the description, join us for the course and really like get clear and grounded in your value because you are worthy of a man who is willing to show up and be in relationship with you now where you're at. You know what I'm saying? So don't allow yourself to, you know, be entertained and be be just preoccupied with a guy on the other side of the world, right? Just because it might feel safe to you. A lot of times women, I think, hide behind uh, potential long distance relationships because there's a lot of fear around, you know, like just putting themselves out well. there. I think right. Men as well. Oh, Dude. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. If someone's taken up the space in there, you're not going to have room for someone new. And when it comes to women who have come to me and say, hey, Mark, you know, I'm maybe I'm in my 40s now. I really want to meet someone. I still want to start a family and I don't feel like I have much time now. And we take a look down their history. It's because they've had dudes taken up bandwidth for years that couldn't really serve them. But that situation's kind of simmered away and years have gone by without them taking the action. So that's where I've really got to kick their butt and say, get him in, get him out. Not in a harsh way. You don't have to be a bitch about it, but you've got to be yeah. kind of ruthless in terms of filtering out the wrong people quickly. Yeah, because men will be energetic. There are men who are bandwidth suckers. There are men who are energetic vampires who just get off on getting the attention of women and they never have any intention to move forward with the relationship. I see a lot of that weird stuff where like men in you know other countries or they're scammers. You know, like there are sometimes there are men who will string women along for a long time internationally because they're trying to build a relationship, take advantage of them. And I'm not saying that's what this guy is doing, but I am saying that like men can be energy vampires and men can get off on just having your attention and not have any intention of pursuing relationship with you. So, you know, stand in your power, ask for what you want, share what you want, and then see how he responds. And that'll tell you everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kelsey says, yes, exactly. I get what you're saying. You guys are... You guys are right one. He has only been on my mind, so it's hard to meet other guys. Absolutely, Kelsey. Kick his butt a little bit. <laughs> uh, hey, it's been a pleasure being online today. You guys have been so much fun. Let's give a shout out. Don't forget to join the program in the description as well. You can, Matt's program is totally free and you can help him uh, test it as a beta tester. It's the only reason it's free and it's just wonderful. So get, in, get involved in that. The link is in the description. Let's do a bit of a shout out. Thanks to Jackie who was online. Mindy was here for a lot of the live stream. So we love, ha we love having you on here, Mindy. Carol was here. Louisa was online. Stephanie, Valana, Kelsey, Kay, Sassy was online. We had Barbara. Uh, I think I mentioned Jackie. Chris was online. Girls Gone Lux. Oh my God, so many names. But I am Glenn Doll, Maria. Wow, everyone. Carol. Oh, look, I, even I left a comment. There you go. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. Matt, it's been awesome fun having you on here, brother. Yeah, I'm so grateful, man. Thank you for having me on your channel. It's been such a treasure to connect with you, to connect with your amazing tribe. You're one of my very favorite uh, content creators out there. And I just love having you as a friend and a partner in crime out here. So uh, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for sharing me. Thanks for sharing me with your, with your audience. And ladies. Hmm? I just said thank you. 
Oh, <laughs> look at that. He's so polite, isn't he, ladies? <laughs> and ladies, if you if you want to come along on this journey with us, Mastery of Connection, my flagship course, it's a $2,000 course. We're starting April 13th. You can sign up at the link in the description and Mark will pin uh, a comment at the top of the box with the, with the link as well. So you can click either of those to sign up. It's totally free. You get a month of lessons, uh, video lessons around beliefs, attachment style, uh, personality type, how to connect with yourself and other people people so you can have the life and love that you're worthy of. And I do office hours twice a week, two hours of private coaching with me in a group format. So it's a ridiculous amount of value. And I'd love to see y'all there. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments as well. I'm happy to answer them. Get involved, lovely ladies. Thanks for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Matt, thanks again. Hey, we'll see you on a live stream real soon. So much fun. Bye-bye. Bye for now.